So uh, hello everyone. Today with the collaboration of Baylor St. Luke Medical Center, we are honored to have with us Dr. Prasad Menon, Professor of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Baylor's College of Medicine. He has over 34 years of experience in the medical field. Today, our session will be entitled COVID-19 and your lungs. Dr. Menon, welcome. Oh, well, thank you, my pleasure to be here. Happy to have you with us today. Can you, uh, can you tell us uh, a bit about yourself and uh, how did you start with Baylor St. Luke? Yeah, I have uh, been with Baylor College of Medicine for about 35 years, and I've been practicing at Baylor St. Luke's for about 25 years or so. Uh, and I was chief of staff at the hospital. Uh, and now I'm professor of medicine at Baylor and my practice is mainly pulmonary and critical care. And in the last six months, most of our practice has been focused on taking care of patients with COVID, uh, since this, that has become such an important part of our practice. Great. So my, fir my first question is, uh, we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the strain of virus that causes coronavirus disease, the respiratory illness responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, already started like one year ago. So uh, uh, what do we know today that we didn't know a year ago about this virus? You know, you know the, this almost changes by the week. You know, we are getting so much information. It's a torrent of information. Trying to keep track of that is, is sometimes difficult. We know a lot about the virus. We know exactly a, uh, the virus. We know its genetic sequence that was released actually by the Chinese uh, government pretty early on in January or so they released the, the uh, the nucleotide sequence so people could start working on it. We know a lot about how to diagnose it. We, need, uh, we know a lot about what works to prevent the disease. Uh, we know a little bit about treatment. There are uh, uh, you know, a few drugs that have been shown to be effective and we are waiting to find out about the vaccines. Mm -hmm. That is what uh, everyone is interested in. And, and so that I would say is kind of the sequence of how the information is. So um, we know that uh, chronic lung disease patients are the most vulnerable uh, uh, the, this time of this, uh, during this pandemic. What can we do to keep uh, chronic lung disease uh, patients out of the hospital? Uh, uh, as we know that they are ranked third uh, leading cause of admission without a pandemic. So with the pandemic, it will be, uh, we will have more admissions, I think, because of the uh, coronavirus. No, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, you know, up to this point, till we get a vaccine, we've got uh, only three things that are effective. Number one is a mask. Number two is uh, hand washing. And number three is social distancing. And, uh, you know, there's a fatigue to doing all this in people, especially young people, they get tired of, you know, being told they have to wear a mask and keep social distancing, but it is vitally important. And multiple studies have shown that even a simple cloth mask works. So, uh, so the first thing for people with underlying problems such as lung disease is to say, listen, wear a mask when you go out, minimize your contact outside, and this includes even family members. You know, we have extended families and sometimes, uh, you know, we just assume that if they're a family, they're gonna be fine. That may not be the case. You may have a, a, a young lady or a young gentleman, you know, bring it and spread it to the older uh, relatives in the family. So you wanna be careful. Uh, and, it, you know, this is hard because this goes against our natural instincts. As mm -hmm. humans, we want company, we wanna hug our family, we want to, you know, be with people. So I think that's really, till we get the vaccine, that's really the number one thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what type of damage can coronavirus uh, cause in the lungs? If, uh, yeah, if coronavirus is, is, is very interesting because it, it varies a whole lot. Uh, you know, it can vary from completely asymptomatic. We do know from serologic studies that there are people who have coronavirus and can be asymptomatic all the way to landing you in the hospital with a bad pneumonia, viral pneumonia. And if you look at the numbers roughly, the way they break out is about 80% of the patients never have to make it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. sure. And about, depending on uh, the, uh, the studies, about 15 to 20% of the people make it to the hospital. 
and about 5% uh, get an intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look uh, worldwide, you know, and about one to 2% of the people die from coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a small percentage, but that shouldn't give us reassurance. You know, sometimes people will say, well, if it's only 1% chance of dying, what is a big deal? But if you take a country like United States, it's got 300 million, 1% of that is 3 million. Yeah. So you really, you know, you have to be careful. Uh, and this is a deadly disease. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the thing to keep in mind is got a wide spectrum. And uh, especially young people, they tend to have mild disease or almost no disease. And that is really the cause for the clusters now in Europe. Mm -hmm. These are young people who go out, who socialize, uh, who have minimal disease. And so they feel kind of, uh, you know, immune and they feel like they can get away with it. But the problem is then they start to infect the vulnerable people who get really sick. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are saying that according to the WHO, 15% of patients develop severe uh, uh, form of the disease and need, and 5% may need critical care. That is correct. That's, a, that's approximately what and most computers what, are saying. How do you advise, what are the symptoms that a person should look at when he's at home? Uh, quarantined, for example, with the disease, uh, when yeah, so the, the, the you know the the initial few uh, symptoms are uh, sometimes like a bad cold or a flu. You start out with nasal congestion, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of cough, fever, and body aches. Uh, there are uh, a couple of symptoms that are unique to this. One is uh, diarrhea seems to be more common than you see with influenza, mm -hmm. and another very unique symptom is a loss of a sense of taste and smell. Yes. In some studies, up to 60% of patients experience a loss of taste or smell. Mm -hmm. And that turns out that that comes on very early and, and often persists for a while. So that, that's a very unique symptom to coronavirus. But otherwise, it is uh, like a bad flu, fever, yeah. cough, nasal congestion. So uh, the, the other unique feature of this disease is that people's oxygen level can drop even before they start to feel very short of breath. Uh, that's a little different from uh, influenza. And so we recommend that people who have lung disease or are at high risk, they really monitor their oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter, you know, which is not very expensive. Okay. Uh, so, so if you've got lung disease, the two things you should invest in are you know, thermometer, obviously, to measure your temperature, and a pulse oximeter to measure your oxygen saturation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So, um, and are uh, people with lung disease are more uh, at risk of contracting the virus at, at the beginning or no? They have the same uh, percentage? No, we don't know that, but we do know that they are at higher risk for bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that people with underlying problems such as chronic lung disease may you know, contract it at the same rate, but they're more likely to get sick and end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And what are the, the new technologies that you are using in treating patients with the complex uh, uh, pulmonary uh, diseases? Is there any uh, new technologies that you are using? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the things we have learned uh, uh, worldwide is that we are delaying putting people on a mechanical ventilator as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, uh, you know, people rushed to put people on mechanical ventilators and they realized they didn't do as well. So, so the, a lot of the technology that, that we have invested in is high flow oxygen. Mm -hmm. So these are special devices that can provide very high flow oxygen uh, and they, you don't have to put the patient on a ventilator. Okay which means that the patient is still awake, can communicate, can cough, can clear their secretions. So that we think is very important. So we spend a lot of effort using high flow oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the second thing that we have invested in, we found useful is a, is a unique device called a helmet. So it's a tight fitting kind of transparent helmet uh, that we fit on the patient's head. And then we can actually provide oxygen as well as connected to a ventilator. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, you know, provide ventilation without putting a tube inside the patient's mouth. And is it available? And then the third, obviously, when the patient's worse, that is available. It's not a very expensive device. Uh, it's, uh, and, uh, uh, and we just actually, uh, some of our colleagues published a paper on that with our experience. Mm -hmm. 
it works well in our institution. And the, and the third thing, obviously, is if they get to the point where they do need a uh, you know, ventilator, then they will be put to sleep and a tube gets put down their throat. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of technology, a very small percentage of patients will uh, actually, if the ventilator doesn't work, we can uh, put them on what is called ECMO. Uh, and what it is, is stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's like artificial heart lung machine. Mm -hmm. And so we take the blood, divert them to our artificial heart lung machine and, and put it back in them. Uh, it is obviously, um, you know, very extreme technology. Uh, it's, um, and it's expensive and it's hard to manage, but, uh, you know, and so, but we have used that as well. And what are so the outcomes? Whole range of, With the this outcomes are not great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, about less than a third of the people who go on ECMO will survive. Okay. And so we reserve that for really young people, you know, who we think will have the best chance of outcome. Uh, in general, uh, you know, worldwide, uh, if you go on a mechanical ventilator, your survival is about 40%. I mean, your mortality is 40%. So about 50, 50 to 60% will survive, the others will not. Uh, which is why, uh, you know, we try to really avoid putting people on a ventilator as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, can coronavirus uh, patients lessen uh, the risk of uh, getting a lung damage? And how? How? What are your uh, uh, advice that's, for that's them? A good, that's a, that's a good question. You know, we. Uh, so we'll, we'll come to treatments in just a minute. But uh, one of the things before we start treatment that has been found to be useful is what we call prone position, is lying on your stomach. Okay. Uh, it turns out that coronavirus typically affects the back of the lungs first, you know, when you're lying down, uh, you, you know, what contacts a bed. So it turns out that I mean, our patients in the hospital will often have them lie on their stomach for six to eight hours a day. Uh, and that tends to circulate the blood through less affected parts of the lung. So they do a little better. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we even do this in patients who are on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is a, it's a big effort to kind of move them on a ventilator, but we have a whole team uh, that's trained just to do that. So, so that helps. Mm -hmm. So, but from a patient's perspective, really, you know, what they need to do is to monitor themselves. And that's why we talked about your oxygen saturation. And once your oxygen saturation drops, we tell patients if it drops less than 94%, uh, then you need to contact uh, you know, uh, a medical provider and come to the hospital because the WHO characterizes that as moderate disease, you know, okay. less than 94%. Uh, so that's when, and one of the reasons we worry about that is as I said, people can have low oxygen without being very short of breath. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes underestimate uh, and, uh, and so very early on, we learned in Europe, for example, in Spain and Italy, that people waited too long to call the, the, the ambulance. Okay. And they were very sick by the time the ambulance got there. So that's why we encourage people with lung disease to monitor their oxygen saturation and call, uh, you know, uh, if their oxygen saturation drops to below 94%. And also we seem to see, at least in the hospitalized patients, about a week into their illness, they, they kind of suddenly worsen a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's a very critical time that we kind of want to monitor them. Okay, great. So, and the, the damage caused by the, the COVID-19, uh, is it reversible or uh, what are the studies uh, after uh, getting the coronavirus? Yeah, it, it, that, that's, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and that takes on a full spectrum as well. You know, most people actually get better with almost no limitation, but there is a population of people who can have uh, a lot of symptoms. You know, we saw in an Italian study, for example, about 60 days out, 60% uh, of the people still complained of uh, fatigue and some shortness of breath. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's a very small percentage of the patients who develop really bad uh, inflammation and scarring in the lungs. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a study, we are following those people to see what the outcome is going to be. 
Are they going to get better? Are they going to have scarring in the lungs for a long time? And if so, is there any room for any intervention? So that, that's, uh, we have a study looking at that. But some people, uh, they are out of breath and they, uh, uh, they are very tired after the COVID-19, but without any uh, proofs, I mean, if, if you do a- Yeah, a, that, is, that is a, you, you bring up a good point is there are many people who have symptoms Mm -hmm. uh, that tend to persist, uh, mainly fatigue mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a symptom. And, uh, you know, I recently had a nurse who got coronavirus. Before that, she was swimming, uh, you know, three, four times a week in a lap pool in, a, in excellent health. And now her x-ray looks much better. We did a breathing test on her, looks okay, but she is just tremendously fatigued. Mm -hmm. can hardly go back to work. So there, there's still stuff that we don't completely understand. Mm -hmm. So again, thankfully, it's a small percentage, but it is, there's a group of people who, who really have persistent symptoms. And there's been a term used, uh, you know, it's called the long haulers, you know, yeah. people who have long duration of symptoms. Okay. Uh, and so that's also one that's being studied. See, why do some people have prolonged symptoms? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you advise people with chronic diseases uh, to get the flu vaccine now? Yes, absolutely. That is, that is extremely important. Uh, and, uh, you know, because that's one thing we know works uh, and it works pretty well, you know, 70 to 80% protection. So everyone should absolutely get the flu vaccine to, to decrease effect. And there's some very preliminary data that the flu vaccine may actually help decrease the risk of coronavirus. I mean, I hate to say that because it's very preliminary data. Mm -hmm. it, it may just be that the people who got the flu vaccine are also more careful yes. and they've been less likely to expose. But we also know that in, uh, in, in the Southern hemisphere, you know, in South America where they have the winter and the flu season when we have our summers, they had a, a better flu season than usual. Okay. And that may be because the things that work against coronavirus, like wearing a mask, washing your hands, social distancing exactly. also help prevent the flu. Uh, so, so I do think absolutely everyone should get the flu vaccine. That is the one thing you can do to, uh, to not to get sick, uh, in addition to the masking and the social distancing for the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you face a case uh, with a uh, patient with the flu and uh, a coronavirus at the same time? Not yet. You know, not in Houston, uh, our flu kind of peaks in December. Mm -hmm. So we have not really started to see flu cases just yet. But in fact, we are getting ready for it. So we are actually, our, our labs are developing an assay so that with a single swab, mm -hmm. uh, we can run a test to look for both flu and uh, uh, and as well as coronavirus, because we, we think that's coming. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you if the, the outcomes will be uh, devastating for the patient if he has both or uh, both viruses at the same time. We don't know yet. I, we don't know, but I, I have to assume that it'll be worse, right? I mean, we, you know, flu itself is bad enough. Yeah. Uh, and then coronavirus is even worse. So I, was, I would assume, you have to assume the combination of the two is going to be worse. Okay. So, and where are we today from um, an effective vaccine for the coronavirus? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, as of today, uh, for those of you who are interested, New York Times has a vaccine tracker. Yeah. Uh, and there are about 64 vaccines out on the market, uh, out in various stages of development. There are about six that have been approved by their government. So the two are Russian and four are Chinese vaccines mm -hmm. uh, that have developed. There's some concern because we haven't seen what is called the phase three trial data yet mm -hmm. uh, for those. Uh, now, in addition to that, uh, between Europe and uh, uh, and and you and uh, U.S. There are about 11 vaccines that are in large scale or phase three trials, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, and it, the expectation is at least uh, three or four of these will have some results by the end of the year. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's a company called Moderna that is uh, seems to have. Uh, they're expecting Pfizer as a vaccine, Johnson and Johnson as a vaccine, and AstraZeneca. 
uh, has a vaccine. They, all these four companies seem to be neck, to, neck and neck. And uh, we expect by the end of the year, we'll get some results. And who, who do you think should get the vaccine first from the population, I mean? Yeah, that is going to be the, that is more of a societal decision, right? Mm -hmm. As to who, who gets. So in the US, for example, they've started to plan and they said, uh, listen, you know, uh, uh, it should be uh, the healthcare workers, other essential workers in the field and people over age uh, 65. But that is a huge number. So the calculation was there are about 20 million healthcare workers in the US would qualify, another 80 million essential workers and about a 50 million people over age uh, 65. So, but I, I suspect this will vary from country to country in how they prioritize who, who needs to get. But it's very clear that the groups that need to get it are the high risk, people with underlying lung disease and heart disease and the frontline workers. Great. And um, what are the effective treatments uh, that you are using now uh, for the coronavirus other than the vaccine? Yeah, and, and you that have is a field that is progressing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we think of coronavirus in two phases. Uh, the first phase is what is called the viral phase. You know, that's when the virus gets in your body is, is multiplying rapidly. Mm -hmm. And the treatment for that is really ideally an antiviral you know, some medicine that, that decreases the, the, the virus. In the antiviral trials have not been great. Uh, one drug called remdesivir has been approved, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, it has got a mild effect. It decreases symptoms, not sure that it decreases mortality or, or makes people live uh, more. Mm -hmm. In the same category of antivirals, you also have, uh, you know, some countries have done what is called convalescent plasma. That is, they take plasma from people who have recovered and infuse it to people who are sick. Again, the results of that are not very promising. They've got some preliminary data. Uh, uh, and, the, and the third group in that category of antivirals is what is called monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. And these are antibodies that target the virus. And this made news when President Trump received an experimental monoclonal <laughs> antibody as part of his treatment. But again, it's not very clear that they work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were part of a big uh, monoclonal antibody trial by Lilly, and the, it just this week uh, got stopped because preliminary data didn't suggest any improvement. Okay. Now, once you get past what is called the virus phase, then we think the real uh, damage comes from the body's own inflammation that occurs uh, uh, to fight the infection. And that's what we think causes a lot of the problems in the lungs. Mm -hmm. And in, when you're in that phase where you're needing oxygen or you're needing mechanical ventilator, there's one drug that seems to work beautifully, and that is steroid or dexamethasone. Uh, and that decreases mortality. That actually means that you know, people uh, live longer. And the sicker you are, the more benefit you seem to get. Uh -huh. uh, but the caution is that that drug should not be used if you're not sick. So for example, if you're not needing oxygen and you take steroids, there's some suggestion that actually may worsen outcome. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, so in, in that phase, uh, you know, once you're sick, the only thing that seems to have great effect is a steroid. And some other drugs that we initially had a lot of hope for, you know, chloroquine and all that don't seem to work. Yeah, okay. So there are I'm multiple trials that have shown that. Okay, lately we heard uh, that some studies uh, saying that uh, aspirin could uh, lower the chance of getting seriously ill and reduce uh, the risk of, uh, of death also. So is it true yeah. uh, that, that they... No, it is, that is still, uh, there are trials going on with that. And, and you bring up an important point is that during, this, during the second phase of the so-called inflammatory phase, Another thing that happens is that your blood tends to clot That's much more so. Mm -hmm. So you, you tend to clot very easily, especially if you're sick enough and in the hospital. So there are trials using higher dose of blood thinners than we usually give in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, when most people come to the hospital, they get a lower dose of blood thinners to prevent clots. So in the COVID patients, we're using higher dose of blood thinners, but it's not very clear that aspirin works. Okay. So that is, that is actually their ongoing trials looking at that. So uh, when do you think this, uh, this virus will go away? <laughs> is it possible to go away by itself or do we need, do we, 
Uh, we definitely need a vaccine. Uh, how, how do you see uh, things in the future? Well, I think it'll, uh, I don't know how long it'll be to go away, but I think the, the only effective, uh, you know, long-term strategy is gonna be to find a vaccine. You know, and the reason the vaccines work is the virus has to be transmitted from person to person. Mm -hmm. We know very early on, maybe it came from bats and maybe pangolin and then humans, but really that's not a mode of transmission. It's not like, you know, you, your dog or a cat gets sick and gives it to you, right? So it's person to person. And so if you can block that person to person transmission, eventually it's going to have to die out. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a rationale is, uh, you know, right now, if I come in contact with 10 people, I may give the virus and if I'm sick to maybe five of them. Mm -hmm. But if let's say they are all vaccinated, then they may only two of them may get it. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so the hope is that with enough people vaccinated over time, the transmission just stops, which is what happened in China, you know, as you know, the, it, it started in Wuhan, obviously they didn't have a vaccine at that time. And the way they did that is they were able to draw a circle around Wuhan, completely isolated, stopped all traffic. And uh, in a sense, you know, put very strict social distancing measures. So then the virus really stopped. So if I get the virus, uh, as we said, 80% of the time, I'm not sick enough to even go to the hospital. Eventually the virus does its thing and it stops. And if I'm not in contact with somebody else, I don't transmit it to another person. How, how do you explain the spike in cases all over the world now lately, uh, especially I, I in Europe and even is, in the Middle East, we have a spike. Yeah, in that, is, that is fatigue. You know, people get tired uh, mm -hmm. of doing uh, the same thing. And uh, there, there are multiple factors that come in, you know, uh, Number one is fatigue. You know, people just, they get tired of doing this. The second thing, and we see this in lots of crises, right? The first time the crisis comes, everyone rises up and wants to be a hero or a heroine. Everyone says, okay, I'm gonna do the right thing and I'm gonna do this. But then after a while they get fatigued and they say, well, you know, and also there's a, a complacency, especially we saw this in Europe. They mm -hmm. said, you know, they put tight lockdowns early in the spring. They had a good summer. And they said, okay, we, I think we are fine. You know, we had a good summer, not many cases. And they start doing the same things that they were doing before the pandemic, going to clubs and bars and socializing. Mm -hmm. You know, even in US, for example, there was a huge cluster in, in, in New York state from somebody's 16th birthday. So people threw a big birthday party for a 16 year old and about 300 people had to be in quarantine after that. So, so I, I think it's the social contact that drives the spikes. Do you think another lockdown is needed? A complete lo lockdown, I mean, in certain uh, countries? I, I think- Or it should be in certain- That is, that is really- Cities or- uh, I, I, I think it's hard to make a generalization because it has to be a country and, and region specific, depending on you know what goes on. We also realize obviously that this is a phenomenal economic hardship, right? For most people when there's a lockdown. And I think that's what politicians also struggle with is, is you know, they, they don't want to see the country economy going to shambles. They hear the stories of people who don't have job, who don't have food. And so it's a tough job uh, trying to navigate that. Uh, but uh, but I think, you know, that's what we're seeing now in Europe now is they've had to go back to closing the bars, closing the restaurants, uh, and even a place like Germany who was very disciplined, they are seeing a spike in cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it has, it is a constantly moving target. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the elected officials uh, I think, you know, for best outcomes, elected officials have to listen carefully to their medical experts, mm -hmm. in addition to listening to their constituents, right? Because yeah. elected officials are very sensitive to what their constituents are telling them, but you also have to listen to the expert advice and say, listen, is this a time to do it? Is this a time not to do it? 
Mm -hmm. uh, so in Houston, we've been a little uh, fortunate. Our elected officials have a very good relationship with our medical experts. So they, uh, they have a conference once a week and the medical experts have really been guiding them as to when to uh, sing and, and that has worked well. But that is, that is a hard thing to achieve because mm -hmm. the public needs to be able to trust uh, the messaging. And when the public gets mixed messaging, you know, it, it is very hard. It is very hard for them. It is very hard for the politicians as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, for the politicians, if they can have a very consistent messaging, it makes everyone's uh, life simpler. Yeah, sure. So, and what about schooling? Are you with, because here in the Middle East, we are struggling uh, and the politicians also are struggling. Uh, they don't know if they should open schools, universities, or we should stay online. So it's been uh, really a struggle for them and for the parents also. Yes. And uh, the, that has been a huge struggle world over, uh, you know, starting schools, especially in US, you know, we start our schools sometime in, in August. So the schools just got started. You know, my son is in 11th grade mm -hmm. and he went to school for a week and then decided to stay home uh, because even at school, there were so many restrictions. Yeah. Uh, he was getting bored at home. So he wanted to go ahead and play basketball with his friends, but the school took down all the basketball courts. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so it is hard. It is hard uh, to do. So they are monitoring, you have to monitor the kids carefully. And then the bigger concern is, you know, is that going to then affect the, the adults they bring home to? But to be honest, if you look at data, mm -hmm. the school kids actually are better behaved than college kids. Okay. Uh, and we are seeing fewer spread from schools because I think by and large, the school kids follow the instructions. You know, they wash their hands, they wear the mask, whereas it's the kids in college who, you know, who are excited to be out of the house or excited to be partying, excited to be socializing. And we think they are the ones who are driving a lot of the, of the spread. And um, they were saying that wearing masks should be uh, like uh, starting from 10 years old uh, uh, kids. You know, now that is right saying, now, that's the only thing that... Now they are saying that it should be uh, worn you know, by uh, kids bit, uh, of six years old. Is, it, uh, is there any study uh, concerning the, the wearing mask at what age? Yeah, is it is, that may be hard. That may be hard to enforce, but at least as soon as a kid is old enough to be able to understand, you know, mm -hmm. it is reasonable to say, you know, wear a mask when you're out, out and about. And uh, we know the mask protects not only you, but it protects other people around you. Mm -hmm. Because we know about 40 to 50% of the infection is transmitted from people before they become symptomatic or they're mildly symptomatic. So uh, that is really one of the, the reasons why the coronavirus has spread so much is that you can spread it even before you start to manifest fever or cough, right? Uh, and, and that is why the universal masking is important because I have no way to tell who's got it and who's not. So the best advice is to wear, uh, wear a mask. Okay. So um, uh, with the infection, before we were saying that only large droplets can, uh, uh, can uh, infect people. And now the, the WHO lately said that uh, the virus may be airborne. So uh, in yeah. very, you know, very that's, small that's places. Well, what we do know is it, 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 there have been experiments that are done with looking at droplets in people talking, uh, shouting and singing. So for example, if you're just talking, the droplets seem to fall off within two meters. Okay. But then if you're singing, for example, you generate a lot more uh, aerosols mm -hmm. and then it can travel a longer distance. So, uh, so some of that is related to the kind of activity that you're doing. Uh, and, and that's why, for example, when we started out, you know, the, uh, in Washington state, there was a big spike in a group of church choir singers uh, because one of them was sick and transmitted to everyone else. And they actually showed that even people who are more than two meters away from this person got sick. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you sing, there's a lot more aerosolization of, of droplets. 
Uh, and so it really depends on, on the kind of activity and how much it can spread. And in one thing that people have been uh, concerned about, we, it, it, I'm sorry? I was asking about closed places with the, with the ventilators. Uh, is it uh, the- Yeah, and then that is an issue. And that is, uh, that is a point that you bring up that WHO said is aerosol means does it just stay there in the air for a little bit? Mm -hmm. And we think it's possible. The, the, the risk may be a little lower than droplet, but it's possible. And especially if you're in a cl closed space mm -hmm. uh, and there's no air circulation, uh, that can happen. And again, the mass will prevent against that. Yeah. Okay. But we also know, for example, when there's frequent air exchange, like for example, airplanes, uh, you know, it turns out that if people are wearing a mask in an airplane, uh, and the airplane circulates their air through HEPA filters, the risk of transmission is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, the simple mass works very well. Works well. So um, what are your guidance for people in general during this pandemic and for the lung disease patients in particular? Yeah, it is, again, I, I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but the, the one thing that we know that works well is masking, hand washing, and social distancing. Yeah. If you can do those three things and be very careful and, and think through about, do you really need to go out and do that activity? You know, mm -hmm. I, I know it's wonderful to see or the same, uh, you know, uh, last week, my daughter who lives nearby, she wanted to go visit her, her friend in Seattle. And I said, why? You know, why do you need to go? She said, had, you know, I'm, before I start school, I want to visit my friends. It, it, and so th those are the kind of conversations to have, right? I mean, do you really need to do it? If you have to do it for your job or go get groceries, you know, yes, by all means. But especially when the spread is high in the community, the more you can distance yourself, and wear a mask and wash your hands carefully. The reason to wash hands is because most of us, we know we touch our faces. And so if your hands are contaminated, you could transmit it. So, so we tell people, listen, if you've been in contact outside, come wash your hands carefully with soap and water. Uh, and you know, so those are really the three things that will prevent the spread till we get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And for people with lung disease, the, the other message is monitor your symptoms. Uh, and if you have lung disease, you know, uh, you know, invest in a thermometer, but also invest in a pulse oximeter to know what your oxygen level is. And if your oxygen level drops to below 94%, you know, talk to your doctor. And uh, what are the most, uh, uh, what are the lessons that the hospitals learned uh, after this pandemic? That's a very good question. Yeah. You know, our uh, you know, this is a constantly learning process. Uh, and uh, if you look at worldwide, the mortality is decreasing. And that's because the hospitals have gotten better at taking care of these people. We've got medicines such as steroids that decrease mortality. Uh, uh, but one of the things we learned in our hospital was uh, that it was very important to prevent uh, healthcare worker to healthcare worker spread. So in about May and June, we had a cluster of cases in our healthcare workers. And we figured out that most of them are occurring because they were congregating in the same room together, maybe drinking coffee together, eating together and talking together. So then we put a very strict policy that all healthcare workers have to wear a mask and a face shield. Mm -hmm. That is even when they are not with the patients, even when they're talking to each other. And after that, we have not had a single case of a healthcare worker getting coronavirus. Right. And so it turned out that people were very careful when they were seeing infected patients, they were wearing the N95 masks, the gowns, but they were less careful when they were talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we put that in place. And so we also, uh, you know, we kind of, for a while we stopped visitations. We didn't want visitors coming into the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now we allow very limited visitation. And we also encourage universal masking for all our patients. Okay. So when they come in, all patients get tested uh, and, and then they get tested every week if they're still in the hospital. And we encourage all of them to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And so we think that has really helped. Okay. And doctor, what is your last message for people out there? 
uh, a message of hope, I mean, uh, during this pandemic. Yes, and I, and I think it is it's important to be hopeful, you know, and not to give up hope. And I, I think the hope is that, uh, you know, uh, we have seen unprecedented research into this condition. Never in the in the last hundred years have has there been any disease that has received this much attention this closely. You know, all countries are spending millions and billions of dollars in, in researching. And, uh, you know, as I said, every week we find new treatments and we think the ultimate will be finding an effective vaccine. And, you know, in the past vaccines would take about three to five years to develop. The Ebola vaccine took about four years. But now, you know, look at this, we started developing the vaccine, you know, sometime in March. And by the end of the year, we think we'll have uh, at least three or four vaccines that'll work. So I think it is coming. Uh, you know, by the time the vaccine gets distributed, it'll be, it'll take some time. But in the meanwhile, if we can just do the, the common sense things, you know, again, masking, hand washing and social distancing uh, uh, and kind of hold out a little longer, you know, be a little bit patient. Uh, you know, this won't be uh, your uh, lifestyle forever. Just hold out for another six months till we get the vaccines. And then hopefully we can go back to our usual uh uh, you know, cells where we are all social beings and we want to be with each other. Do you think we will ever get to uh, our uh, uh, life previously, previous life before Corona or? Uh... <laughs> I think we'll, we'll, we'll get there uh, and uh, we'll get there again because of all the technology and the de development. Uh, I'm hoping, I mean, we look at the success of China, right? I mean, essentially China was able to eradicate and prevent the spread of, uh, of COVID and Wuhan now is back to normal. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, we uh, don't have the ability to act like China did, you know, in a, in a very authoritarian fashion, uh, which is why it's difficult. But, but I, I'm hoping that with the vaccine, with enough people vaccinated, with enough people being careful, eventually we can stop the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like in small clusters, but we'll be able to contain that. Mm -hmm. And that the majority of us can go back to our, uh, our, our, our lives. Great, doctor. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you okay. for the information. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed speaking with you and, and my very best wishes to everyone. Thank you. Okay. And stay safe. Okay, you do the same. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.